and we will get started. So this is our webinar series. Hi, Carrie from Dover. This is our webinar series where we explore different issues um, that relate to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the League of Women Voters prioritizes diversity, equity, and inclusion just as much as we prioritize our nonpartisan status. And so one of those things is that we hear folks really asking about um, land acknowledgments. Um, I don't know if anyone heard there was an NPR uh, story about land acknowledgments in Australia, right? Um, and that was, uh, it was pretty cool and interesting to hear that. Um, you know, giving land acknowledgments, land acknowledgments is incredibly important, but first we need to just know our history. And so who better than to invite my friend, Dr. Daniel Rivers, who is a professor of history um, at Ohio State, and we're going to have a conversation with him. But first, I just want to run through a couple slides. Um, if you can go to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. So just want to remind everyone that voting laws have changed. Um, you know, we always talk to folks about making their voting plans, you know, how they're going to vote, making sure that they have everything they need um, to succeed their proper ID that they register to vote, all those kinds of things. All those voting plans have to change. Um, because um, voter ID laws have changed, um, the uh, absentee balloting process has changed deadlines, there's all kinds of different pieces that have changed. Early vote, now you need the same ID that you need on election day if you go in person. And so please uh, check out our website and let us know what you might need from us. We're doing all kinds of trainings about it, we're creating materials, we're here to support you so you can support voters. Next slide, please. We wanna make sure you know that our convention is coming up. Remember, we do this every other year. This is a chance for members to put democracy to work in, in that um, not only are there workshops and panels um, but there are and a gala, but there's also the opportunity to um, vote on the leadership of the organization, our priorities, our budget, and things like that. So make sure your membership is up to date and please make sure to register. Next slide. Um, membership is so important um, for safeguarding our democracy. So um, make sure again that you are a member. If you're not, please join. Um, we uh, are not only for women, uh, we're for all gender identities and um, we would love to have you. And then finally, we also need funding. So where does your donations go? It stays right here in Ohio for things like printing all those voter information cards that are going to explain to folks the, the changes in the laws. Um, you know, talking, you know, ha having a relationship with the Secretary of State and key lawmakers about policy issues and so much more. And I think that should be it. Um, we may show those at the very end. If you have just joined, I'm asking that you go ahead and put your name and where you're from in the chat. And I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Daniel Rivers, who is um, an associate professor of history at Ohio State. Um, he also uh, heads up the American Indian Studies program at Ohio State, I believe. Um, and so he his specialty is in LGBTQ history as well as American Indian history. Um, and I'm going to let him talk a little bit about himself as well. First, I'm hoping you can talk about your own. Oh, I don't see you. Where did you go, Daniel Rivers? Yeah, it appears he's not on, Jen. Um, I, I don't have his contact information. I don't know what happened. <laughs> uh, I will I will email him. Great. Thank you. Um, and this is so much more awkward when it's in webinar mode, because it means that I can't see faces and just be interacting with all of you who are in the, um, you know, in, in the you know, in the Zoom with me, but we have lots of folks from um, across the state, Cleveland, Hudson, Granville, Beaver Creek. Um, oh, Daniel Rivers is saying he's here. Can you hear me now, Jen? Yeah. Yeah, I was there the whole time. It was really interesting. It kicked me off early on and then brought me back, but I was somehow disabled from, 
I don't know, the different functions. All right. Well, um, first, would you like to just tell us a little bit more about yourself? So you've been at Ohio State, you've been in Columbus for 10 years. Yeah. And first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I was telling Jen, who I haven't seen in, in way too many years, pre-COVID and before that, um, how delighted I was when she invited me. The League is a venerable institution. I was trained in women's history and I have great respect for the League. And I was happy to say yes. Um, so strangely enough, because time flies, I've been here for 10 years. Um, I grew up in Oakland, California, and I stayed in California for most of my education. I uh, dropped out of high school. I was uh, very grew up very poor in cars and made my way to Berkeley, graduated from there because it was a good, cheap public institution, and then ended up getting my PhD from Stanford. So I stayed within California and then uh, took the job here in 2013. I grew up, uh, I am a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, um, and I grew up in a proud Native American lesbian separatist household in Oakland in the 70s. My mother um, left Oklahoma in the mid 60s as she was coming out to herself and uh, left to see the world. And, and we settled in um, Oakland, California in 75. We were living in a VW van. Mom realized that she could be an artist and a proud dyke and uh, in the Bay Area, and I grew up in, uh, that word, by the way, is a very proud sort of nationalist word that I grew up with in my household, and I grew up in uh, in that space. So it was a wonderful way to grow up in many ways, although we certainly were involved in all kinds of conversations with the world around us, but I always felt like um, I had come from some kind of lesbian, feminist, Native American cabbage patch. I don't feel like I had <laughs> history, you know, like, who are my people? And so my dissertation work and my book was the first history of lesbian and gay parents and their kids from World War II to the present, uh, Radical Relations. I was very proud. It took me like 15 years, but I found the stories of tough working class butch and femme households, for instance, in the 50s, um, very underground. Well, you know, I thought we were in trouble in the 70s. It was anyway. So there's that. So uh, and then for the last bunch of years, I've been working on the history of the two-spirit movement and LGBT Native American lives and experiences from World War II to the present. Uh, just a reminder that my two fields, Native American modern, Native American history and LGBT history are not, uh, you know, not mutually exclusive, right? Intersectionality, um, as you know, my own upbringing shows. And that's been really interesting. And I wanted to say that should the league want in the future, I would love to come back and talk about LGBT history. I teach it every year. Uh, and I have much on LGBT history in central Ohio. I have a whole lot on lesbian feminism coming out of Cincinnati. It was a very important site historically. Uh, and I'm always happy to teach about it and talk about LGBT history. Um, so uh, I don't know how much I'm going to get through today. You might also want me to have me back to talk about the 20th century at some point in the future, because we'll see where we get. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. I decided I would chat with you about some large scale concepts in Native American history and indigenous history in North America. Uh, I also heard that incredible NPR story on Australia, and it was part of the sort of, you know, conceit of the story, the structure of the narrative was how land acknowledgements have become so de rigueur in Australia, um, while in the United States, we are in process, right? But, uh, but they often mark our politics when we use them. And in Australia, everybody from every political uh, stripe speaks land acknowledgements. It was, it was fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah, it was really interesting. So I'm going to cover some sort of large scale notions of Native American history as I think about them and tie them into our, our region and space. So the first thing I thought I would start with, I guess the first thing I'll start with, oh, and I just wanted to thank Nazik um, for all of her help. It's been really easy to engage and communicate about this talk, and I really appreciate that. And thanks to Jen, too, for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen, which is a PowerPoint with you all. And so I thought since, you know, land acknowledgements are so much a part of our conversation these days that I would start with a land acknowledgement as I would write it. And I wanna just say that there are many in the native community who feel different ways about uh, how we would acknowledge the land in central Ohio. And I respect that. I have my own concepts about what a land acknowledgement here entails. And so that's what this is, it's just mine. Um, we are in conversation right now at OSU, deep conversation about what we are going to do as an institution. And I, I'm often asked to talk to 
We just, just talked with a corporation about land acknowledgements in Columbus last month. So these conversations are certainly going on. So I'll speak this. And, and then I think a bunch of my talk was sort of like mm, engage with this too. And, and, and you'll see at least why I would speak a land acknowledgement this way. So I would like to acknowledge that the land occupied by the state of Ohio is on the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Miami, Shawnee, Lenape, Seneca, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Wyandotte peoples. The state is on land ceded through military coercion in the 1795 Treaty of Grinville and evacuated by the removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So you can see that that engages with a bunch of historical moments uh, that I feel are important to acknowledge the, the large swath of what's happened to Indigenous peoples here in Ohio. But uh, I think first here in the talk with you all, I'm going to actually go even farther back um, than that goes and talk about something called the Columbian Exchange. And this is an important sort of first um, way of thinking about Indigenous history here in the United States. And the Columbian Exchange, we get that term from a famous book in 1972 here that I have show, shows here, Alfred Crosby, which I read in grad school early on. And Crosby is really the one who gives us this, this important notion. And the notion is that absolutely uh, the arrival of settler colonialism and trade colonialism to North America um, was uh, was incredibly important at the level of communication across cultures and all the myriad ways that happen between human beings, but also that contact happened on all different kinds of levels biologically, um, and that even at the level of the natural landscape, European arrival made huge significant changes. And Crosby talks about how the European conquest introduced new animals, plant species, honeybees, cats, rats, English birds like sparrows, red foxes come to Virginia as part of British gentry hunting lifestyle. So that even when we're thinking about cultural movements across the Atlantic, um, it's happening at all different biological levels. Uh, new types of grasses and seeds, rye and barley, would arrive in the in the shoes of the settler colonialists, right? Or even in the in the warped wood uh, uh, of the boats. So so on all kinds of levels, uh, we get this huge crossover across the Atlantic with contact. And I just want to run through some of that here with you all. Things that were brought by the Europeans to the New World included smallpox, typhus, influenza, uh, livestock like pigs, cattle, horses, sheep, goats, intended plants like sugar, cane, wheat, and seeds for planting fruits and vegetables or for um, initiating commodities for the global market, but also, as I said, unintended plants carried over a seed in the hooves of animals and in the possessions of the Europeans. Things taken back by the Europeans would include the tomato, the potato, here, let me see, there we go, tobacco, which of course, I don't know how many of you all know, many Native American tribes utilize tobacco as a, as a, as a sacred part of ceremony. Uh, it has much to do with uh, interdependency and the engagement and communication across cultures. We'll talk more about that if anybody wants to, wants to. I think I'll talk a little bit about notions of interdependency as I move on from this. But tobacco was an important ceremonial um, resource in the new world. Of course, it enters into the global market uh, as an important luxury item, right? So it, it's it's nature changes, but but it comes from the new world. So basically, conquest occurred even at the most basic levels. Early settlement transforms the natural world of the indigenous North American tribes. And here I want to turn from the biological world and talk about the meeting of different mindsets. And the interesting thing for me um, as a Native American historian and a tribal member myself is that I grew up, as I think a lot of us folks do, um, as members of indigenous nations in the United States, taught by our elders that non-Native people generalize a lot about Native Americans, that they say things that are true of all Indians, and that that's a mark of uh, lack of knowledge. And we developed that critique growing up in indigenous spaces. But the interesting thing for me is I studied native history over the last whatever, 25 years, is that I've come to believe that there are some large scale things we can say about the indigenous peoples of North America. Now, that's of course not 
without lots of exception and caveat. And I can't say that I know anything at that level about indigenous people south of the modern day Mexico-American border because I haven't studied them like I have North American tribes. But I do think that we can say some really important, valuable, large scale things about indigenous North America. And I think that it helps us to think about what this meeting of the minds was, if you know, if I may, um, of these two huge cultures as contact occurs and, you know, plural in both instances, of course, cultures. So European arrivals uh, who come to the new world were largely guided by a mindset of expansion in this moment. This is the 16th century. It's the emergence of global capitalism in all kinds of complicated ways. Um, uh, white supremacy has emerged from the Iberian Peninsula in the 14th century. I can talk a lot about that too, how we get to modern racism and colorism. It happens in a really specific way in the 14th century, but that is emerging along with the, uh, the Atlantic slave trade and the emergence of global capitalism. And so European arrivals bring a mindset of expansion that one of my favorite historians, Joel Martin, who's a great historian of the Muscogee tribe, and he wrote a wonderful book on the Red Stick Revolt, the Muscogee uprising, um, called Sacred Revolt. And Martin calls what the Europeans brought with them the gaze of development. And he says that for European arrivals, the world looked like something to develop, to engage with, to change, to transform, to own, to utilize, to profit from, all of these things, right? And it's amazing the degree to which we can see this. It's just over the decades, it's been really shocking to me how true this is. So that if we look at Raleigh's writings um, to Queen Elizabeth, right, in the 16th century, Raleigh's writing back and he's saying, you know, there's diamonds in the grass. Now, Raleigh's also lying, which, you know, that throws something into the mix, right? He's, he's embellishing or making things up because he wants to sell a colonial project, but it matters that that's how he sells it, right? Um, he sells it by, by telling the queen what kind of commodities there are, or Verrazano coming into Manhattan Harbor for the very first time, you know, the first time a European comes in to that beautiful space and he's in these little rowboats because, he, you know, the big ships can't dock on the island. And so he's coming into Manhattan Harbor in these little rowboats and the people who were coming to greet him in the water, uh, they're small scale Algonquin tribes. Um, they would have had wigwams and um, structures and little villages along, uh, you know, this marshy wetlands that is now not, doesn't look like that, of lower Manhattan. And they're coming out into the water. And Verisano writes in his journal that we have, you know, it says, these people are so kind and incredible and, and, uh, and open in spirit. And then in the next moment, he says, they'll make incredible slaves, right? And so for Verrazano, even these human beings are, are impacted by what Martin calls this gaze of development. And so that Europeans arrived in the new world, and it wasn't just uh, Verrazano or Raleigh. I mean, those are pretty, you know, those are figures in a particular space, right? But if we look at the writings of everyday settlers, settler colonialists, 200 years later, they are still perceiving the environment of the new world um, to be as something to be developed. So it might not always be with this understanding of diamonds in the grass that comes from a particular positionality within an emerging global market, right? Or you know, colonialism from the crown, you're talking to the queen, but somebody 150 years later working on a small homestead might talk about the virgin land that needs to be uh, engaged with, that needs to be developed, right? And, and there is that same gaze of development that Martin's talking about. One traveler in the late 1790s would say, almost every desirable thing in life might be produced and made plentiful here and catalog the animals, the plants, the minerals, all to describe economic possibilities but at the same time, he lamented that it might give pain to a traveler who must now view it but as a forlorn rude desert with which little labor might be made to blossom like a rose. So that an important subset of this notion of the gaze of development was this tragedy that the world, the natural world, and I say that with a little bit of you know sarcasm, a tragedy that the natural world around them was not being utilized in its in its to its full potential, right? Um, so that what was seen was a rude desert, even if it was this gorgeous, incredible ecosystem, right? Because it was 
It was not being utilized the way it should. And so settlers and officials would see it as shameful that the native tribes did not cultivate the land and extract the natural resources as they would. And from this moved easily a notion of native peoples as lazy, incapable, primitive, right? Um, sort of uh, inappropriate stewards or shepherds of the land and the natural world. And, um, you know, while careful about talking about global religions, I don't ever want to um, denigrate any particular global belief system. Um, I'm not a Christian, however, which always makes my students in Ohio think I'm either Muslim or Jewish, <laughs> but I'm not any of those. I was raised in uh, Native American spiritual tradition, um, largely shaped by lesbian nationalism. <laughs> and, and as an outsider to world religions, it does strike me when I read the, the Abrahamic holy books, right, the Old Testament or the Torah, uh, as it's importantly understood in the Jewish tradition, that in Genesis, there is this moment where God gives unto the first humans the responsibility of stewardship over the natural world. And it's an open question, and Jewish scholars have engaged for centuries about what this means, right, this stewardship. And it can be very beautiful. I certainly want to acknowledge that. It can very much come with a lot of consciousness to it and understanding of the dangers of interdependency. But at the same time, there is in this notion in Genesis a sense of human beings having power over, even if it's benevolent power, right, of a kind of hierarchy of power. And what I want to say to you is that that is one of the big differences and one of the large scale things we can say about Native American, North American understandings is that that idea that human beings have a different notion of power, uh, have a have a different order of power within a hierarchy over the natural world. I would argue that Native American tribes like my own and many others completely different from mine in many different ways, nonetheless shared actually a sense of human beings position in the world as being rather fraught and scary <laughs> because we existed in a huge and very scary complicated web of which we were only one vulnerable part right so that is a, a different way of thinking that i would argue separates native american understandings of the universe to a large degree in north america from european understandings so, and i'll get back to that in a second so europeans radically altered the land with a different worldview of controlling nature they chopped trees, they cleared fields for single crop farming needs. Um, this was so important that one historian of early America has actually said that settlers hated trees. And you can kind of have some sympathy for this, right? Because if you've come all this way and you've lived across the Atlantic, you've survived this horrible trip, and it's either like make it the first winter or that's it, and your family has to survive, and you're faced with this, you know, land that has all these huge rocks you have to clear and all these trees that have to be cleared and the stumps have to be cleared before you can grow crops, you might grow to hate trees pretty quick. And so um, that is, in fact, you know, what happened. We see the clearing of huge amount of earth. And of course, this creates new boundaries, fences, bridges, roads, towns, and villages. Wood had been in short supply in crowded England, and the British colonists took advantage of all the available lumber for building firewood and the development early on of timber and shipbuilding industries, which is one of the ways in which the colonies uh, survive early. So deforestation, as we now know, meant changes in climate, water supply, flooding, soil exhaustion. Colonists understood none of this and in fact criticized Indian land use practices of controlled fires for clearing and that replaced soil nutrients as messy farming. Um, and they also pointed to the multi-crop planting. Uh, my tribe and other Southeastern tribes consider sacred the agriculture that we practice, that women practiced in our matrilineal, matrilocal tribes uh, of the three sisters, corns, beans, and squash. And we now know that the way that the Choctaw and many other tribes planted the corn and the beans and squash would be grown together and the beans would go up the corn stalks and that they would fix nitrogen. That this actually was a really important uh, complex way of growing. But of course, to the Europeans, they looked at uh, these, these crops and said, this is messy, this is lazy. Uh, and so we see this sort of meeting of these different ways of thinking. So by the 18th century, it was evident that more than land was being altered. <laughs> as the impact of European colonization on indigenous cultures and social organization was uh, acting as what some people have called 
um, a shatter zone, a, a destructive force that rippled across the continent. One of the biggest factors in this, of course, was disease. The Europeans brought with them germs and viruses that erupted into epidemics of killer diseases in American Indian populations. These diseases spread quickly along trade routes and began contaminating groups of natives that had never even seen a European. Smallpox, of course, was one of the most contagious and deadly diseases in early America. Measles, influenza, diphtheria, scarlet fever, typhus. One has to rethink accounts of early America as an empty wilderness or virgin land when one considers that perhaps previously heavily populated areas have been really radically recently depopulated. My mentor, Richard White, who I had the great honor of studying with at Stanford, would estimate that we're looking at about 75 to 85 percent uh, deaths from smallpox in these years. Impossible to even comprehend, right? The massive death of everything around you. And of course, disease undermined native confidence and the power of traditional healers or shamans and introduced um, uh, Western ways of thinking about disease and medicine to native areas along with the death. Uh, so let's see. By the late 1600s, driven by dislocation that resulted from struggle between the French and British empires. Remember, it's the French and British who were largely warring up in the eastern seaboard. And there in this slide that I've given you, we can see the Great Lakes region, right? And this has so much impact on us here in central Ohio, on the history of indigenous peoples in central Ohio. So uh, by the late 1600s, driven by this dislocation here that resulted from struggle between the French and the British Empire. Uh, the Great Lakes region was, uh, was in massive chaos as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which uh, we sometimes learn to speak of as the Iroquois Confederacy, but that's not the right way to say it. <laughs> the Haudenosaunee, um, the great confederacy of uh, warrior tribes that inhabited Southern Canada and, and Northern New York State there in the, in the Great Lakes region. As the Haudenosaunee tribes were put into massive migration and movement, uh, they went to war with Algonquin tribes in the Great Lakes region. And we had this massive conflagration that you can see here. And much of this actually is over a struggle brought on by trading. And that's my point here in this slide, that the, the first big trader empire, T-R-A-D-E-R -E empire, here uh, in the Great Lakes region was, was one about beaver fur. And beaver fur uh, in the 1600s becomes a huge global commodity because beaver hats come into fashion in Europe. And this is a sort of classic example for me of the ways in which the global emerging market, manufacturing, capitalism, uh, sort of uh, you know, trade and fashion operate to impact um, the indigenous world here in North America. And in fact, if any of you all have ever hung out at Astor Place in uh, New York, it's one of my favorite subway stops and favorite spaces in the world actually, coming right at the edge of the East Village. And if you go down uh, to the subway station at Astor Place, that's the six line, and you look up on the wall, there's these incredible old friezes, I think the word is, F-R-I-E-Z-E-S, -E I'm really bad at art history, sorry. But there's these incredible sort of bas relief things up on the wall that nobody ever bothers to look up at. And they're beavers. And those beavers are there because John Jacob Astor, who Astor Place is known after, known uh, is named after, was he built his riches on in part the beaver fur empire. So uh these beaver furs became really lucrative, and uh we call the wars between the Haudenosaunee and the Algonquin tribes that you see there on that map, which were really all wars of disease. They were wars of refugee people, right? They were wars of this thing that can be called a shatter zone, uh, a, a, a series of cultures that are deeply dis destructively impacted by, by conquest and colonization. Um, we call those the beaver wars because they were over these beaver hats. So, uh, finished goods also replaced native skill and craftsmanship, and competition with other tribes created the need for guns and European technology. Um, if one tribe traded for guns with the British or the French, then anyone engaged in war, political, or land struggles also needed guns to maintain an open playing field, or equal playing field, sorry. And initially, this wasn't the case. Uh, I learned this also from, from Richard. You know, we 
we, as in, I don't know, Western culture, dominant paradigms, I don't know who the we is there, but, you know, uh, one might be tempted if you didn't know anything about any of this to say, oh, well, European trade goods were so incredibly superior that obviously Native American peoples just needed them right away. That's actually not true. Um, you know, Native American lifeways were incredibly complicated and, and had all kinds of logic and, and um, inertia of their own. But what Richard taught me is that while first these trade goods are actually revered because they are symbols of communication and engagement with, with, with new peoples, right? And that gets to some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in a second, which is that in contrast to the gaze of development, Native American peoples often had this really complex way of seeing the world where human beings were vulnerable, as I said, and not powerful over all other natural uh, forces, but actually also where engagement with other human cultures was held in deep, deep respect. And again, not only because it like led to good things or was was like, you know, a way to benefit, but because it was a powerful moment where things could go bad or good and a moment of vulnerability, a moment of possibility and engagement with other human beings was really deeply important. And because of that, although the Europeans didn't understand this, often native tribes and leaders would revere and really deeply value European goods because they were a symbol of this new communication. Europeans looked at that and thought what I said, you know, that these were so superior to these peoples that they held them as, you know, God objects, right? So complete deep misunderstanding. But what happens is that over time, and of course, always underlain by this horrific 80% die off, right? The dislocation of cultures based on the spread of the disease and military power and all kinds of other things. Over time, European lifeways made inroads. And so that if we see shifts towards um, Western European styles of farming, for instance, then over time, European tools like hoes and other farming implements become essential, right? As the, at all of the shifts, just as an aside, I mean, that's not an aside. <laughs> Women also lose huge amounts of power in this moment because in matrilineal, matrilocal tribes, such as mine and other Southeastern tribes and North, most, uh, not a lot of Eastern woodland tribes in the North too, uh, across the Eastern seaboard were matrilineal and matrilocal. And in our tribes, women had control and power over agriculture. And as you see um, Western European forms of agriculture developing, this is a massive way in which native women in these spaces lose power drastically in the 1700s. So all of this is occurring. Um, and I think, I think, oh, yeah, I always do that. In my head, I completely anticipate my slides. Anyway, yeah, that's, <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And then the second point here is that in the pre-revolutionary period of settlement and European imperial struggle over the new world, quote unquote, certain tribes are affected differently than others based on location, size, and power and their ability to play one European power off another. And this is important because location matters. And I always teach my students that, you know, the, the strip, the littoral strip, first 200 miles in from the water, those tribes uh, are affected radically and quickly, right? So if you're the Pequot uh, up in New England, you get affected really quickly by the arrival of settler colonial, British settler colonialism. But if you're my tribe, the Choctaw in modern day Mississippi, in Louisiana, um, you're impacted, but not in the way the Pequot are. In the early period, you hear tell of what's happening on the coast, um, but you got time to pivot and think about it and to learn to distrust the Europeans deeply because you know what they're doing over there. But also when you engage with the kind of ragtag element that makes it to where you are, lots traders, not settler colonialists because they're the ones who can make it in through the brush and the marshes and want to because they want to trade with the tribes there, you can play the imperial powers off of each other. So you can say to the French, mm, those British are giving us some really good trade goods. I, I think you need to up your game. And you could say the same thing to the British. So in the early period, unlike the poor Pequot uh, or the Powhatan there in colonial Virginia, you had a certain amount of power, right? And you could navigate uh, and, and sort of work, pivot and work within this system. And that's gonna be important because it helps us understand why the American Revolution was fundamentally horrible for indigenous peoples of North America, which it pretty much was. Um, and that'll help us when we get to that, sort of understand that. So let's see here. 
So before I go on, I want to talk briefly about this mindset of the tribes that I've alluded to here. So let me use um, let me use as an example a Muscogee deer hunter, right? Um, so if you're a Creek or Muscogee deer hunter and you're hunting in the sort of like uh, pin oak forests of the American Southeast, you're hunting these little white-tailed deer before the Europeans come and you kill a deer, you're gonna approach the deer and as it's dying, you're going to sit and ceremonially thank it and uh, offer up gratitude and, and acknowledge the kind of interdependent situation that you're in and that the deer's life is ending uh, to provide you with sustenance. And I can't actually do it complete respect. It's a very complicated cosmology that I'm not versed in, right? But uh, as a believer, but, but you're definitely gonna be engaged in a communication with the deer. And I think non-native peoples have sympathetically, but um, mistakenly understood this to sort of mean that Indians are better, that we're more in tune with the environment in some ways, or that we're, I mean, maybe in some ways that is true, it, but that we are actually like of a different level of morality, right? Like almost other. And you see that particularly in the 60s when Native Americans are used as icons of, of transcendental consciousness, right? In a really actually reductive, racist way. Um, and so... So this is a misapprehension. In fact, what's happening here is that the Muscogee hunter is, is engaged in this conversation with the situation because he's terrified that if he doesn't, then the deer spirit is going to come back and it's going to give him deer sickness and he's going to die, right? This is like, this is self, this is out of self-concern because that fundamental difference because of that fundamental difference, the idea of being in a large web of intense forces and complex interconnections um, and of being dependent on it as a human being, the ecosystem in all of its complexity and that sense of vulnerability and smallness, right? And that is a fundamental difference, I believe, between North American indigenous peoples that actually now through the work of indigenous feminists and movements that came out of women of all red nations and red power in the late 70s. I'm thinking here of Winona LaDuke, but also Madonna Thunderhawk, that the, these women and the environmental movements, native environmental movements that they've engaged in, actually do utilize some of these senses of vulnerability, of being one small part of a large web, of, of all kinds of things for modern environmental politics. So I, I'm finding that more and more interesting myself and lecturing on it a lot when I teach. Um, so uh, I want to turn here to the Ohio region before I get to the period after the revolution. Um, it's 1240. All right, let's see. I'm going to check the Q&A. <laughs> oh, yeah. Keep going. No, uh, I'm good. I was just distracted by Tiffany's comment. I'm like, oh, yeah, I will never make it to the mounds, but I want to come back and talk about them. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Tiffany, we're going to um, I'm actually on the Ohio History Connection um, board and we're going to do that at another time. But thank you. No, it's that. awesome, Tiffany. Thanks. And totally connected to all the stuff I'm talking about. And maybe you can have Marty and John or something. You know, anyway, um, they're awesome. And Newark Earthworks, so amazing. Um, so so let me turn for a second to the Ohio River Valley and talk about this region that we're in uh, and sort of connected to some of this stuff. So an interesting thing about this space here that we occupy is that many folks hypothesize that this, although this was the site, uh, you know, as Tiffany alludes to really importantly, this was the site of huge important ceremonial centers, both the Adena and the Hopewell cultures have their centers in this space, right? And then the later Mississippian culture that I am a, that I am a descendant of, that is my mother culture, the Mississippian uh, is, it also has a powerful, if it's not centered here, it has it's a powerful site of Mississippian emergence, right? So that's all true, but folks hypothesize that that because of the smallpox, we think, um, not entirely, actually, the Mississippian cultures also had the problem that the Mayans did, right? You get like large urban concentration and with the sedentary crops, and then you get like die off if the crops go bad, you know, but, um, but then also the smallpox had ravaged after the Mississippian decline. And so folks think that for like 300 years, this space was unoccupied. And that what happens is that uh, about, um, no, in the 1500s, they think, 
uh, that we see migration into this region as the result, 1600s maybe, as the result of those beaver wars and other conflicts up in the Great Lakes region, right? That actually what populates this space is that it is the edge space of tribes that are on the move because of the disasters that are occurring uh, in the Northeast. So in the Ohio River Valley, tribes such as the Wyandotte, and the Wyandot were originally Huron peoples from the Ontario region, they fled west, driven by disease, fighting with the Haudenosaunee, and they relocate to an area around Detroit, which is founded by the French in 1701, right, and provides kind of a central trading region. Fort Detroit is really important. They were also attracted to the possibility of hunting the white-tailed deer in the Ohio region to the south. And I think I have a, here we are, there's the Wyandotte the height of the white-tailed deer, as it was in my spaces in the Southeast, was one of the major goods that American Indian tribes traded with the Europeans. So the Wyandotte had come west to Detroit and Northern Ohio, where they could hunt deer and trade the skins with the French at the trading posts. At the same time, the British, not to be outdone in the trade possibilities of this region and driven by those competitions I alluded to, opened up a post in Sandusky Bay in 1745. In the same period, the Delaware or the Lenape, uh, and I, I think the Delaware would rather be called the Lenape, but these are very deep, con like I can talk more about this at some later time. Sometimes it's very clear when native tribes would rather you utilize their words for themselves instead of the settler words that emerged, right? But in other cases, because those settler words have become the word, the title of the, the way we call the nation, so that, uh, you know, it's the Delaware nation, then it's very important to actually continue to relate to those words, because those are the words by which we identify our nations, right? So that's a shorthand, but it's, it's complex. But the Delaware, or the Lenape, had begun to settle in southern Ohio, along the Ohio River near the mouth of the Scioto. Now, the Delaware were moving west because of another major push factor in the region, different than imperial trade competition, disease and intertribal warfare brought on by these factors uh, like the Wyandotte. The Delaware were fleeing the expansion of British colonial settlism, settlement westward from Pennsylvania and northwestward from the Virginia colony. So the Lenape for me, uh, are the example of a refugee peoples. These peoples had actually originally inhabited the harbors to the south of Manhattan Harbor. Uh, they were the New Jersey tribes, I think of them that way, which is probably wrong, but I, they're like the tribes of Northern New Jersey and those little bays and inlets right there. But they of course had been violently displaced from those spaces and they had gone on a what 150 year long refugee migration and they had kept at the edge of settlement in the period before they got to where we are here in central ohio they had been in pennsylvania and they had been a ragtag peoples that had been denigrated and faced racist brutality at the edges of the colonial cities in pennsylvania but then they had continued to flee westward across the ohio river valley and by the late eight, uh, 18th century, they were in the Ohio River Valley region. Um, so uh, this expansion steadily increased, of course, of settlement until it became a violent flood by the early 19th century uh, in the Jacksonian period, which got us prey I'll get to by the time we end today. But in the mid 18th century, settlement in Western Pennsylvania pushed the Delaware into the Southern Ohio River Valley. At the same time, as a series of fraudulent treaties with colonial governmental representatives stripped the Delaware of their land on the books. Um, and then from the Northeast came the Seneca and Cayuga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And the, uh, so here's the Seneca. The Seneca migrate into the Northern Ohio River Valley in the last half of the 18th century. And they are a tribe from upstate New York, from the Haudenosaunee, and they are uh, directly sort of engaged in and moving with this uh, dislocation. And they come into Northern Ohio, often labeled Mingo, which was a derogatory Lenape word. Um, uh, they settled into villages in the region, often intermingling with Shawnee, Lenape, and Wienda peoples. Um, so then, of course, also the Shawnee. And the Shawnee, I think of in some ways as the great presence here in central Ohio, certainly here in Columbus, when I think in a direct way of whose land I am taking, uh, it is the Shawnee. The Shawnee are 
they stay walk with me here in this space always since I came here. Um, and in the beginning of the 18th century, the Shawnee had lived near the Delaware in Pennsylvania and in the Southeast. But as other tribes began moving west along the Ohio River, uh, they did as well. Tensions were high almost immediately with the Shawnee, here particularly with settlers from the Virginia colony in the region that now is modern day Kentucky. Uh, I always have to remind the students that that was the top of the Virginia colony down there, right? Um, and there was intense racist violence and settler violence against the Shawnee to the south across the Ohio River uh, from what would be modern day Kentucky into Ohio. Um, by the mid 18th century, uh, the tribes could not escape intensifying struggle between European powers and the Ohio and Great Lakes region was becoming increasingly drawn into the colonial power struggle. Um, so then we have the Miami, uh, a tribe that had migrated east and south into modern day Ohio in the early 17th century. Miami chiefs, including Little Turtle, one of the greatest and most famous Miami warriors, would fight the encroachment of American settlers into the Ohio River Valley. Um, Let's see. So although American Indian tribes of the region saw alliances with the European powers as a possible way to forge relationships that would help them to preserve their autonomy and control over their way of life, the Europeans perceived of these possibilities very differently. When one Delaware leader, Shingas, engaged the British general Edward Braddock in a discussion of the right of the Lenape to use the land after the war, the general would reply, no savage could inherit the land. So not surprisingly, many of the tribes in the Ohio region ending up siding with the French um, and the British suffer a major defeat in the region in 1755. But by 1763, the British had won the war, a development that signals the beginning of the end for the autonomy of the tribes in the Ohio River region. And the tribes would not only side with the French against the British, but then many of them will side with the British against the American revolutionaries for many of the same reasons, right, uh, during the American Revolution. And I think that brings me up here to what I tell the students that, uh, uh, let's see, does it bring me up to this soon? Um, what this brings me up to is the idea that the revolution is awful for uh, North American tribes, because it ends this ability of the tribes that I mentioned before to negotiate with the imperial powers. So whereas before tribes could pit the imperial powers, largely the British and the French, off of each other and thereby carve out some degree of autonomy, right? Uh, after the American Revolution, there was one non-Indigenous power and it was not negotiating and it wanted the land. So the American Revolution is a, a dismal moment for the North American tribes. All right, well, that brings me up to 10 to one. Jen, uh, let me know how things are going. Let me stop sharing the screen here. Well, yeah, huh? I mean, I kind of am enjoying this. I'm hearing some people are enjoying it. So I think go ahead and just keep going. Awesome. <laughs> and if we need to go a little longer, let's do that, I think. Okay, well, there's nothing an academic likes to hear than just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about like, let's, let's plan for 20 more minutes. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> All right, y'all. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. So the American Revolution brings the desperate condition of the tribes um, in this area. And I want to sort of say here that what we're talking about is something called the Trans-Appalachian Plateau. Uh, there's a strip of land that's really crucial and important that runs sort of along the Appalachians, right? And, and what we're seeing is that uh, in two different spots, um, both the American Southeast, I'm thinking here of the incredibly fertile uh, world of Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, right, what will become the Cotton South, uh, and the Ohio River Valley. In these two spaces, not accidentally, right, the Ohio River Valley, also extremely fertile, I don't want to be biased as a Southeastern tribal member, right, um, in these two spaces, we see huge settlement. So huge increased settlement in what we call the early republic, that's the 1780s and 1790s coming into the turn of the century there, right, Huge pouring from Philadelphia, like Pennsylvania, they're not Philly, but Pennsylvania, across the Ohio River, right, over at uh, Wheeling. Um, you know, huge people, peoples pouring in, and then lots of people pouring down into the American Southeast. So in these two spaces, 
We get massive settlement after the revolution. It is a settlement largely of uh, poor folks. They are still British Islanders. I don't know, you know, I'm not going to go too into like all the arcane bits of US history. But in this first period, what we see is largely British Isle immigration. There is some German immigration. It will increase by the early period of the 19th century. I mean, the yeah, 19th century, and uh, they will face anti-German discrimination. But largely what we're seeing here is like Scotch-Irish Presbyterian uh, migration, lots of poor folks from different parts of the British Isles coming in here in the 1780s, 1790s, including Andrew Jackson's parents, who were uh, incredibly poor and come in in this period and migrate south through the Carolinas, through the low country, and push into what was then the frontier, which will become Tennessee. Um, and the mindset of these impoverished uh, desperate and uh, hopeful uh, settlers who come in the early Republic uh, is going to be the mindset of Jackson and the mindset that will bring us Indian removal. Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. So, so that's happening. And so the revolution in the early Republic bring into kind of desperate condition, uh, bring into relief the desperate condition of the tribes in these spaces. Um, they are caught uh, first, in between the warring factions of the imperial British government and the rebellious colonists. And in the moment of the revolution, lots of tribes seek to negotiate peace. The Delaware, whose villages, as they had moved west from Pennsylvania, now lay directly across the Great Trail that ran from Fort Pitt, now known as Pittsburgh, which was contested by the American forces, and Detroit, which by this time, the French having been beaten, was solidly under British control. And so the Delaware were like a chain across this, right? Um, and in 1775, in fact, the Delaware send delegates to both of these outposts in an attempt to negotiate a neutral, peaceful stance, right? So they're desperately trying to work it out. At the same time, as I said before, settlers are pushing up through the Virginia colony, constantly attacking the Shawnee, Wyandotte, and the Delaware in southern Ohio, right? And in this atmosphere, it became dangerous for any tribes people to even attempt to journey to Fort Pitt, much less Philadelphia, to address the Continental Congress, right? I'm not saying the Continental Congress were going to really give a lot of time and space to the tribes people if they did show up. We get very little mention in the American Revol I mean, in the American Constitution, and won't go into that. But uh, but it's an important mention. But it's only very little. Um, but nonetheless, it, all of this violence, the settler violence, prevents the tribal leaders from even taking part, right, in this uh, this moment of of, of government making. Um, so the Shawnee and the Wyandot particularly become increasingly alarmed at the quick violence of frontiersmen from K the Kentucky region uh, to the south, whom they call big knives, and their willingness to pretty much indiscriminately kill any Indian that came across. And in general, the tribes beyond the Ohio River Valley become more and more insecure of their position and suspicious that the American colonists wanted their land. However, there was in this moment still powerful factions among the Shawnee and Delaware that called for an unwavering path of peace. It's important to understand that for many uh, Eastern Woodlands tribes, and here again, I think I can speak pretty generally. For instance, let me use the Muscogee as an example. For the Muscogee, for the Creek Indians, who are a tribe dear, you know, close to the Choctaw in the Southeast, powerful. Uh, modern day Alabama was their sacred homeland. The Creeks, have a way of thinking that says that there is a white path and a red path. And the red path is the path of violence. It's the path of contestation. It's the path of anger, of defiance. But the white path is the path to follow almost always, if you can. And it's the path of peace. It's also the path of balance. And the notion of balance is really deeply important to Eastern Woodlands peoples. And even the very cosmology of the Creeks, which saw the world as broken up into an upper, lower, and middle world, but, uh, held as one of its fundamental principles, keeping those worlds and their ways of being in balance, right? It's really crucial. And you can see how a notion of balance would become really important if you saw yourself as a tiny little vulnerable part of a big web, right? <laughs> so, so all of those things are really deeply interconnected. So that's all to say that, that the path of peace was really crucial and that it was held out for until, you know, it was impossible, right? And so we see that here in this moment when even as the devastation of the revolution and, and uh, the impossibility of survival in these frontier spaces is occurring, we still get really powerful voices for peace. But in 1777, the Shawnee chief Cornstalk, his son, and two other influential Shawnee tribal members are killed by frontiersmen while in Fort Pitt on a mission of diplomacy and peace. This was a really horrible moment, um, which which showed the Shawnee, uh, as they understood it, that peace was really not going to be possible. 
This and regular skirmishes with frontiersmen coming up from the Virginia colony intensified tensions within the Shawnee and drive the tribe towards the Red Path. Soon after this, the other main advocate for peace with the Americans in the region, the Lenape or Delaware chief White Eyes, was murdered shortly after taking part in the Treaty of Fort Pitt with American representatives. These murders and the encroachment set the stage for the Ohio River, I mean, for the Ohio tribes to join with the British at Detroit in an effort to stop the erosion of their land. For the Shawnee, the violence that welled up north across the Ohio River was particularly loathsome, and in 1780, they accompanied British troops in a raid to destroy the Kentucky settlements to lash out back at the violence. By the early 1780s, the Ohio frontier was unstable and violent. There was no solution for the tribes. Those who had chosen to ally themselves with the British at Detroit in desperation were bitter and suspicious of their European allies, who they did not trust, even after the British were defeated at Yorktown and the Revolutionary War comes to a close, violent conflict consumed this region we're in now. Um, of course, Native Americans are completely left out of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. It is, is, it is, is if they did not matter. The British and the Americans don't even discuss them, the people whose land this was. Um, they are beside the point. Um, I talked about how the American Revolution did not go well for the tribes, <laughs> not a good thing. Um, in 1785, representatives of the Wyandot, Delaware, Ottawa, Chippewa meet at Fort McIntosh to attempt to come to some kind of agreement over the Ohio region with the Americans. To the representatives of the new nation, and this would be true of Jackson and true of waves of um, American representatives in different moments, all Indians were guilty of siding with the British. It didn't matter what they had actually done, uh, whether they had fought on the side of the Americans, whether they had not, uh, and they were regretful impediments to progress. This era of government ordained settlement uh, would see a second wave of resistance by the tribes that would end only with Tecumseh's defeat in the Battle of the Thames in October of 1813. So here I wanna talk about uh, this moment uh, uh, in the first years of the New Republic. So in this period, in the late 1780s, violent skirmishes by the Kentuckians continued across the Ohio River. In the face of the increasing aggression of the US, representatives of a large number of Western tribes meet in 1786. They address the United States as an organized confederacy. Despite differences among the tribes, they all agree to ask the US to determine the Ohio River as the Western border of settlement. So I, students find that very interesting. We exist in the region where the last stand in some ways occur. I mean, I feel the Lakota behind me saying, oh yeah, the last stand occurred, you know, in the 1870s. <laughs> I totally, all honor to the Lakota forever for their, you know, for their incredible stance against the U.S. military. Um, but this moment, this moment before the onrush of settlement, before the dam breaks, right, uh, and, and we get the waves of settlement that will reach as far as the Pacific coast, right, before that really happens, there is this moment of resistance, of pan-Indian resistance, which makes it so beautiful and important because it's across tribes, right, that occurs uh, here where we are, uh, and the Ohio River is, is the line of, of, of that stand. So, um, so there is this meeting in 1786 where the tribes asked the U.S. to determine the Ohio River as the western border of settlement and to settle disagreements left over from the Revolutionary Era. Um, uh, as, as, so, but at the same time, as land speculators and settlers hurriedly buy land across the Ohio River, clashes between the Shawnee, the Delaware, and the Americans increase. And in 1790, a sanctioned military campaign crosses into Ohio country, leaving Fort Washington in Cincinnati to advance northward to Indiana, subduing Shawnee, Delaware, and Miami peoples along the way by destroying anybody they encountered, men, women, or children, whatever villages they encountered, uh, and decimating the tribes. The expedition destroys many villages, burned them to the ground and burned food stores, but eventually had to retreat back to Fort Washington in the face of massive Shawnee resistance. In 1791, a force of Shawnee, Miami, Delaware, Cherokee, and for this reason, I believe, the Cherokee get included in some land acknowledgements. This is one of those differences I was talking about. The Cherokee come 
to this region and all honor to them to fight with Tecumseh, right? Tecumseh was this incredible leader and this moment of Shawnee resistance was unprecedented before or after. And Tecumseh traveled the United States, uh, the regions to bring native peoples into this struggle. The Cherokee send warriors, but the Cherokee are not a historic tribe of this region. This is not Cherokee land. That is not to denigrate the, the Cherokee of course in any way, it's just to be correct. Cherokee land is a specific space. It's in Georgia and Tennessee. Um, and it was denied the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears. So, uh, but the Cherokee, the Wyandotte, the Shawnee, the Miami, the Delaware, the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomis in 1791 all attack a second expedition moving on the tribes in Ohio country under the leadership of a guy named General Arthur St. Clair. And in the largest defeat of American forces by an American Indian military force, something my mother always loves to tell people about, the Americans are defeated. These victories, however, proved fleeting, even though they were symbolic. And in the following four years, between 1791 and 1795, the tribes suffered the pain of a long protracted struggle as waves and waves of settlers poured illicitly across the Ohio and the American military continued its campaign to pacify the American Indians. In 1794, the tribes would suffer a brutal defeat at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, paving the way for capitulation. And in the Treaty of Grinville in 1795, 92 representatives from 15 tribal groups ceded large portions of modern day Ohio and large sections of land in the Great Lakes region, including what would be the site of the modern day city of Chicago, which was stolen from the Potawatomi. The treaty declared the intent of the American nation that the Indians who remained in the region would become farmers. And many people also use this treaty as a way of deciding who should be thanked in the acknowledgments. And I honor that position as well. I think that's an important historical understanding, right? If one chooses to say that we acknowledge all of those who signed on to this treaty because they were clearly as signatories engaged in this negotiation and resistance struggle against the American nation state. Um, I have respect for that, but I don't see them as synonymous. Uh, this was again, a pan-Indian alliance from tribes from many different spaces. And that's important and historically really beautiful. Um, but that didn't mean, that doesn't mean that the land that we are on here was, was, their, was their homeland. Um, so just to sort of explain some of the like ins and outs of land acknowledgements here in central Ohio. Um, so one person who does not sign the Treaty of Grenville, no way, was a young experienced warrior named Tecumseh, who by that time had lost three brothers and his father to years of fighting with the Europeans and the Americans. Um, so that brings us up to that. Um, I think that's a pretty good place to stop because where we go after this is removal. And that's a discussion of Jacksonian understandings of the world, Jackson himself, the, the poor uh, non-native settlers like Jackson's family, he's orphaned by 13 uh, in the frontier. Their perspectives, not only on tribes like mine in the Southeast, but their perspectives on tribes in the Ohio River Valley. So just as a sort of forward way of thinking, so that I, I mean, nod to that, so I can connect that up to you all here in the last few minutes. Uh, and as I said, I'll be happy to come back and, and chat about this in detail. And I have a bunch of stuff to say about red power movements here in uh, Cleveland, which are really crucial too. And I could chat with you about that. Um, but uh, what we're what we see here is that Jackson's story is kind of me metonymically uh, symbolic of what's going on here. That you know, so Jackson's parents migrate uh, through the Carolinas and then out towards the frontier in the southeast. Other people are migrating in the exact same moment, pushing through Pennsylvania into this region. Tecumseh, uh, Tecumseh will die uh, in the War of 1812. His incredible sacred pan-Indian struggle will fail, of course, uh, and the settlement will push through these two regions into the Ohio River Valley, into the American Southeast, and Jackson will ascend from being a frontier attorney who would gladly jump up at any mention of Cherokee sightings, grab his rifle from his law office and go out and kill Indians indiscriminately. Um, he will rise up from that to be the first senator of the nascent state of Tennessee. He will be elected as the American president in 1828. And with that, he will bring a frontier settler mentality 
in all of its complexity into the American presidency. And uh, he will declare his intent upon arriving in the presidency and about removal. And that will come true in 1830 with the passage of the Indian Removal Act. And then we get two huge forced military removals, one in the American Southeast that we know as the Trail of Tears that honors the 4,000 of 16,000 dead uh, in the ethnic cleansing of the Cherokee, right? But my tribe is also, my great, great grandmother, Hokti, was the only one of our family to survive uh, the march. Everyone dies of cholera, but Hokti, I believe that she's adopted by a Creek tribe because Hokti is a Creek word that means woman. So I am always, of course, I honor the Creek for adopting my nine-year-old great-great-grandmother. <laughs> That's how I happened. And uh, so all the Southeastern tribes are forced march. But there's also horrific forced removals from this region. These are the two regions, such that a new really good book by uh, a historian about removal in the Ohio region, that if I come back and chat with you, I will certainly be indebted to in my comments, is called The Other Trail of Tears, right? Because there is, in fact, one other huge military removal that happens here in the state of Ohio. And it's no accident. As I said, these were the two places where settlers were pouring across that Trans-Appalachian Plateau in the early Republic into these incredibly fertile spaces, right? And so these were the two places where in 1830, uh, the US government initiates what will be a 20 year process of removing the tribes from both the American Southeast and then the Ohio space. Thanks y'all, awesome. Thank you so much. And then if we kept going, we'd eventually get to um, American Indian nations not being here um, in Ohio. Uh, right. No American Indians are here in Ohio. And then, but then the government deciding in the mid 20th century that they're going to close reservations or attempt to do that and send um, tribal uh, folks from, you know, both the South, I think the, the Southwest was Cincinnati. Um, and then um, really from South Dakota to Cleveland. Um, so we have, we'll, we'll keep going. This is what I love about this is like people are super excited. So we're gonna take this as take one and Dr. Rivers and I are going to find another time to do take two. And in the meantime, you did get one reading which is the other trail of tears. That's and a, uh, good. it's a good one. Well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times indigenous people are like, yeah, don't learn about us in the books because we didn't, you know. <laughs> So it's good to actually ask an indigenous um, history scholar uh, what books to read, because I know that a lot of times there's, you know, the, the depiction is not what what my indigenous friends would find is, as uh, helpful. I'll <laughs> yeah, just say helpful. helpful. <laughs> um, so, um, but anyway, Dr. Rivers, thank you so much. People loved it. They stayed on. And um, we also did have one person who is uh, going to OSU with the, the 60 program. I forget what it's called. Program, yeah, 60. program 60. One of my favorites. So many of my best students come from program 60. I love so, having in my class. We, so I'm going to make sure that we that if you can tell us what classes you got going or how how that yeah. individual can find you, we'll do that. It will get that information. Okay. Awesome. It's so great. And I very much would love to come chat with you about LGBT history, y'all. I, uh, yeah. you know, it is my labor of love. It is, it's not taught yet in the public institutions. And I just keep hoping I can keep teaching in college. Um, and yeah. I'm teaching that in the fall. And it's such a beautiful history. And there's some incredible Ohio LGBT history that, you know, hasn't even made it into the books yet. So anyway, it was my great honor to be here. The league rocks and, uh, you know, keep doing the good work. It's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, and you know what? Well, you, since you're still on, I wanted to yeah. let you know that uh, William Harper is on and he just wanted to say hello. He said his brother-in-law is also from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma who grew up in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Nawatha Krebs. Mm. Halito. Halito, William. It's really wonderful to hear from you. Um, it's incredible how much Choctaw presence there is in the Bay Area. And of course, it has this whole historic dimension, right? My great uncle Floyd comes out in the 30s and settles in Fresno. And I really, that's the 30s, the Depression, but then also the huge centrifugal force of World War II and the shipyards in Oakland bring Choctaw and other Native peoples to the Bay Area. It's a beautiful history. So honor to you. How about, did, did any... Choctaw folks, you know, in, were they engaged in the Indian of all tribes takeover of Alcatraz? Oh, yeah, definitely. They were Choctaw for sure. 
there were powerful Southeastern presence. There was some Choctaw there. I recently, well, a few years ago, wrote an encyclopedia entry on Wilma Mankiller, the great oh. first principal chief yeah. of the Cherokee. And right. uh, Mankiller is, uh, she would describe herself later on and years later as a housewife in Hunter's Point, where she had gone to grow up at the age of 10 through relocation. And her family members are on the island and she's running support. So powerful Southeast wow. tribal presence there. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize she was at Hunter's Point. Okay, well, we're going to keep talking, Dr. Rivers. I think everyone's really excited about this, which I love. I, I did tell you that league members were, were a little bit nerdy. We like to get into the details. So um, we'll definitely have you back. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Bye.